Hello everyone, once again to late online from the Natural History Museum. Although we're not at the Natural History Museum, we are uh, streaming from our homes to you in your homes. Now, tonight we have a very, very special late in front of us. We are going to be talking quizzing dinosaurs um, and uh, we'll be talking with some paleontologists in the panel discussion and then uh, I'll pass it on to Khalil and Alison to quiz you on your knowledge on dinosaurs. But remember, these shows are live, so what you can do is uh, send us your questions and comments in the chats in YouTube and Facebook, and during the panel discussion, we'll try and get through as many as possible today uh, through, the, through the show. But without any further ado, let me introduce you to the guests. I'm really, really happy that they are able to be here tonight. Hi, guys. Hi. Now, Hi, we Hello, guys. We have three really special guests. We have Susie Maitman, Joe Bunser, and uh, David Button with us. They are paleontologists at the Natural History Museum. And uh, I'm not going to tell you anything else about them because I like them to introduce themselves to you. Uh, so guys, I'm going to ask you, can you tell our audience what do you do at the museum? But also, if you could talk to your younger self, would they be really excited that you're doing what you're doing at the Natural History Museum? Did you always want to become a paleontologist? So let's start with uh, Susie. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, my younger self would definitely be quite excited. I grew up collecting fossils in the Dorset coast. And I loved dinosaurs from when I was a little kid. So yeah, my my Younger self would definitely be impressed. Um, I am a researcher at Natural History Museum. I work on bird hip dinosaurs, so particularly things like Stegosaurus. Um, and um, I'm also the curator of the, the dinosaur and the uh, crocodilian moth collection at the museum. That's uh, Susie over there. Let's go now to David. What about you? So, yeah, I'm another uh, dinosaur researcher at the museum, and I'm specifically interested in figuring out the ways in which dinosaurs ate their food and what this meant for their evolution. And I think if I could talk to my younger self, I think they'd be pretty pleased uh, with how I've ended up. I don't think they'd be happy about anything else, but I think they would be happy about me working at the museum and on dinosaurs. I think they'd like that. <laughs> and what about you, Joe? What do you think uh, little Joe will say about your, what do you think at the moment? Yeah, well, I'd, I'd like to hope that um, younger Joe would be reasonably happy with where I am. Um, I'm a PhD student at the uh, museum as well and uh, I'm researching a group of dinosaurs called the Iguanodontians. So it's uh, everything kind of related to Iguanodon, the famous one that a lot of people would know. Um, they've all got these uh, thumb spikes that are their main characteristic. So yeah, I think you'd be pretty happy. And uh, what I also really hope is that your younger selves will also be really happy that you're here talking to, to me to ask the SICOM team at the Natural History Museum, but also uh, showing your knowledge to the rest of the audience. Now, before we, talk, we start talking about your amazing research and we start discovering how uh, dinosaurs used to live in the past and how we know that, um, I would like to uh, ask you a little bit more about when did we start looking at fossils and when did we start when did we realize that they were not uh regular reptiles they were a different kind of group susie would you mind telling us a little bit more about when this dinosaur first discovered and, and described it by scientists yeah so dinosaur fossils have been found um for a long time you know for, for hundreds of years but people didn't know what they were so often they were interpreted as the remains of giants of fossil giants or mythical creatures um, and it wasn't until the early part of the 19th century when a, uh, a naturalist called Gideon Mantell, he was actually a doctor as well, um, and he discovered and he recognised uh, that some teeth that he'd been given were actually the teeth of a herbivore and a reptile. And they were huge. So he saw that they were similar to reptiles today, but much, much, much bigger. Um, and he realised that there must have been a giant group of extinct reptiles out there that he no longer has on Earth. And then um, this really kind of triggered lots of people to recognise these bones as fossil reptiles. And the founder of the Natural History Museum, Richard Owen, he realised, he, he worked on lots of these bones, there he is, he worked on lots of these bones and he realised um, that they could all be united into this group um, by the characteristic of having their legs all kind of held under their bodies rather than sort of out to the side 
um, like in, in reptiles today, and he named this group Dinosauria. So he not only named dinosaurs, they were first identified in the UK, um, but also he founded the Natural History Museum. That's amazing. But even though they already realised that they were a little bit different than um, than all the rest of the reptiles, even extinct or, or, or still living reptiles, it, it was still a little bit tricky to figure out what they looked like at the beginning. Um, they didn't always go the way they look right. Is that is that correct, Joe? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, so you can see here, this is one of the first um, kind of reconstructions that were ever attempted for dinosaurs. So this is uh, from the Crystal Palace Gardens that you can still see them now. And um, these were commissioned and they were based on um, the finds that they had at the time. So at the time we didn't know too much about dinosaurs and um, kind of thought that they were just kind of big lizards, you know, waddling around on all fours and there wasn't that many differences between them. And a key thing with one of these, uh, it's uh, based on what we had of an iguanodon at the time. And at the time, we'd only found um, one kind of of these spikes that I was talking about. And uh, at the time, they thought, well, maybe it goes at the end of the nose. Um, a lot of lizards today have kind of a bit of a, a bony sort of shape on the end of their nose. And that, that must be the case with dinosaurs. But as we find more and more different specimens, um, what we know really expands and we realized that these were actually thumb spikes so we found another specimen that had had two of these spikes so then we can put together a bit of a clearer picture and that still goes on um and continually we do that all the time we're continually reshaping what we know about these animals so i suppose when they find the two spike it was just like either two horns or there might be something else so let's let's go for something else i think we have a, a picture as well of how how we think about iguanodon now is completely different, isn't it? You can tell, uh, and this might change in the future, maybe? Do you think, Joe? Maybe, I mean, we, like I said, we're constantly finding new specimens um, and we always have to keep our minds open that things can change. So one of the key things of, of being a, a paleontologist is that you're always open to, to new ideas for, for new and exciting things that might be found. And I suppose it's fair to say, you mentioned that how they discovered just one of the thumb spike, then the next one, it's not that easy to dig up a complete skeleton with all the bones in the right place or even with all the bones. I think the three of you um, have been digging up dinosaurs in, in many different places, which is, is amazing. Um, but yeah, how likely it is to find a complete skeleton? David, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, so, um, yeah, you're right. So um, we are very, it's very unusual that we'll actually get a skeleton or a mostly complete skeleton of a dinosaur. So typically we'll tend to only get very small fragments of bone or individual pieces of bone. And so in fact, there are many dinosaur species that are known only from like a single isolated fragment. And um, this obviously causes quite a problem. So we already seen with the Crystal Palace dinosaurs were back then they're working kind of in a vacuum because they had little scraps and bits of various dinosaurs. Um, and they didn't really have anything to help understand them. They didn't have much to compare them to. Whereas today, um, we have some circumstances where we're very lucky and we have very complete skeletons like the Mantellosaurus that um, uh, Joe will be able to talk a lot more about. And by having these like individuals, they can act as a bit of a Rosetta Stone to help us understand like the smaller scraps we find from other species. So in this way, our understanding of dinosaurs is always improving, but it is dependent on us continuing to be able to find like these rare but very good and um, well-preserved skeletons. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So tonight we are going to be discussing and exploring um, how not only fossils but also modern technology and modern technique how uh, is helping paleontologists like our guest tonight to figure out more about dinosaurs, how their lifestyles were, were but also things like how they moved what sort of things they ate and how they ate them, how how they they went on on the lives, things that they can't see because uh, they are extinct. So, in regarding those new te new technologies, Susie, what would you say have been one of the most significant advan advances in in the field of paleontology? How how have things uh, significantly changed? Well, I think that the most uh, the biggest advance that we have now is the ability to virtually reconstruct dinosaurs. So we can laser scan, which is what the, the picture that I'm doing here uh, is. And we can laser scan the bones to produce virtual 3D models of them. And we can also do CT scanning 
to investigate parts of the bones that we couldn't look at previously. And, and what this does is it allows us to build a virtual model of the dinosaur skeleton. Um, and this is really, really, really useful because we can do all sorts of things like we can um, figure out where the muscles attach. Um, we can, by looking at the bony processes on the bones, we can attach them digitally. Uh, and then we can look at, for example, if we were do doing that with legs, we could look at what the muscles were doing, the forces they were able to pull up, um, the, the bones forward with, um, and how figure out, uh, uh, and help us figure out how fast the dinosaur was moving, for example. We're going to talk about um, how we can do similar things with feeding as well a bit later. Um, another really cool thing that we can do is dinosaurs have um, their brain is kind of surrounded by a bony brain case. And the inside of the, of the brain case um, allows us to reproduce really faithfully the shape of the brain. Um, and that allows us to understand a lot about their senses, you know, their sense of smell, their sense of hearing. Um, and previously, obviously, in order to get access to that information, we had to slice up the bottles um, and then look at the brain and produce a cast. And as you can imagine, curators are actually not that happy about you slicing up their relatively precious dinosaur fossils. So this CT scanning technology allows us to um, actually you know, virtually access the insides of these bones, which we couldn't get out before. So that's really moved forward our understanding and allowed us to kind of move beyond the bones and beyond just studying you know, what species is what um, to understand way more about the way that the dinosaurs live. That's amazing. We're going to have a, a look through how about how you go on about doing it, how how those things have changed and, and different examples of that and your work, uh, because I always find that it's a bit of like um, a detective work. You're putting together so many pieces and then figured it out, things that you can't see with your own eyes again because you can't travel in time. Um, now we're getting already we're getting loads of questions from our audience. So I'd like to uh, throw at you um, one of them because it has to do a little bit with the, the representation of of dialects. Now we have all these technologies. We we can um, scan as uh, you've explained, uh, Susie, really well, or even look inside. Um, but whether we like it or not, there are dinosaurs that are represented in books, in pop culture, in films. And so Daniel F uh, Holmes from YouTube is asking: Is it true that velociraptors were incorrectly represented in Jurassic Park? I bet you've been asked that question many times uh, before. Who would be good to answer that? Um, David, do you want to go for it or do you think somebody else? I can go for that if you like. Yeah, so um, Velociraptor has potentially the um, not necessarily welcome award of being the most overrated animal of all time. So we think of Velociraptor from Jurassic Park being this sort of like, like scaly, terrifying thing. So the first thing which most people are familiar with is that Velociraptor wasn't that big. The um, raptors in that movie were based upon um, larger relatives of it like Deinonychus. Velociraptor itself was only about two meters long, so it's similar in sort of size to a um, like medium-sized dog or even sort of like a turkey. And then equally, we know it wasn't scaly. We know from a variety of evidence, both from its relatives and also from uh, some spe uh, some evidence from bones themselves, that Velociraptor was covered in feathers. So it couldn't fly, but would have had wing-like feathers on its arms and feathers across the rest of its body. Um, it wouldn't be able to open doors, really, because its wrists um, moved in the wrong way, because um, like other dinosaurs, its wrists were mostly locked into this sort of motion and not that kind of motion. Um, and of course, doors didn't exist yet. But even then, particularly when people look at the evidence of the brain, this perception the Velociraptor is very intelligent. Now, we do see that compared to other dinosaurs, Velociraptor has a relatively large brain. If we compare that to living animals, it sort of falls in the range of like most living birds. So unlike what it says in Jurassic Park 3, Velociraptor wasn't as smart as a chimp. It was as smart as sort of like a hawk or something. So like good enough to get by its day, but not necessarily that smart. And that finally then comes round to the whole pack hunting thing. So obviously we all think of it as a vicious pack hunter. There's actually very, very little evidence um, that Velociraptor was a pack hunter. And even like its big toe claws were more of like stabbing implements than they were like slashing tools. So really, Velociraptor is perfectly cool in its own right. It was a sort of relatively small predator of sort of similarly sized small dinosaurs and other like smaller creatures. It just wasn't as like, um, like as hyper aggressive and powerful as its movie counterpart, which have, have you believe. That's a fair enough um, answer. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, we also have another um, question that I'd like to throw at you now, but I want you to think about it during the show and then we'll go back um, later because uh, you've been asked um, by Flossie, who's five, if you were a dinosaur, what would you be? 
So I'll get back to that to you later. I'll let you think about it um, during the show and then you can decide what dinosaur would you be if you were a dinosaur. But yeah, we get loads of questions about what your favorite dinosaur is as well um, and why you like being a paleontologist. So I'll, I'll reconvene on that uh, later on today. But there's another interesting question. Um, Karen on Facebook is asking, can you get DNA from bones? Um, Susie, do you mind answering that? Yeah, I can take that one. Well, um, actually, there's an increasing body, ev body of evidence to suggest that um, soft tissues do preserve over geologic timescales. So remember that these dinosaurs lived from about 230-ish million years ago to 66 million years ago. So they went extinct a really, really long time ago. And, you know, normally or, or previously, we always considered that um, so soft tissues, things like proteins, couldn't preserve over those sorts of timescales. However, there is this increasing body of evidence to suggest now that we are getting at least the breakdown products of things like proteins um, in the fossil record. And that's very, very cool. And that's another way in which new technology is helping us to understand how the dinosaurs live. However, nobody has as yet found dinosaur DNA. Um, and in fact, the, the oldest DNA in the fossil record is only about 1 million years old. So 65 million years too young um for the dinosaurs so at the moment no we can't get dna from dinosaur bones however i'm not going to say that we never will because who knows what might happen in the future it's always good to leave that door open over there <laughs> Future, but also for, for future films that might come up um but let's go back to to the topics um Joe, so um, Antelisaurus is a, is a dinosaur that's quite um, special for you. It's in our Hins Hall, so in the main hall of the museum. Um, it's a beautiful dinosaur, it's a rarely complete dinosaur. Uh, but can you tell us a little bit more about it and why, why is it so important? Absolutely, yeah. So um, Antelisaurus is one of the most complete British dinosaurs that we, we have in our collection, in fact, in the world. Um, so it was found in 1917 on the Isle of Wight. Um, and it's about 80 to 90 percent complete. So everything that you see, apart from the skull uh, on display, is all real bone, which uh, you know is, is quite rare as well. So finding a full specimen like this is is very rare. But yeah, it's important. And you were recently 3D scanning it because it's a complete dinosaur. So why not? Can you tell us that a little bit more about how you went on doing that? And I think Zuzi, you were involved in that as well. So Joe, do you mind starting? And then if you have anything to add, Zuzi, you can go ahead. Yeah, so um, obviously at the minute it's kind of behind glass on a really nice display. Um, but as part of my PhD, we wanted to really study its bones in detail. Um, so in order to do that, and so that we could put it back on display as soon as possible, we decided to take it all apart. And then um, you saw Susie using the 3D scanner in a picture before. And we took each individual bone and did a really detailed surface laser scan of every single one. And then we could stitch all these images together on the computer afterwards. And it gives us a one-to-one -one size 3D model of every single bone from the dinosaur. So then with those scans, there's lots of things we can do. We can 3D print them. I've got a little thumb spike. You might just about be able to see there. So that's the exact size it was. Um, so you can 3D print them. You can use them in other software to kind of run different analyses on them. Uh, so or the different forces that might have been applied to them when they were when they were alive. And the most important thing, I think, at the minute is that we can then share these results with people around the world. So if, if someone can't come to London, obviously, at the minute for, for research, we can share these files with them and they can study the bones as if they were holding them in their hands. That's amazing. And I suppose sometimes you put them out there as well so the public can also see them. I know that there's some specimens in the museum that we can actually ask, 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 access them and have a look at them uh, from our homes as well, which at the moment I think is quite handy, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. I think um, that's definitely one of the most important things. I think um, going forward as well, I think we'll see more of this kind of uh, 3D scanning in our collections. Which is really cool. That's amazing. Um, now, once you have it scanned, we've we've uh, heard about what the benefits about having it, how you can actually study it better. I suppose it's handier as well than having the bones on you. Um, but how do you reconstruct it um, virtually, and what sort of things do you are you interested in 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 reconstructing? Um, David, do you mind uh, going for this question? Who? Sorry. Uh, David, how do you how do oh, we yeah. 
Yeah, sorry, Kada. Right, so um, as you're saying, scanning, we can get a lot of information from dinosaurs. So what we have here is like a brief sort of show us some of the things we do. So this is with Hypsilophodon, which was a small dinosaur from the UK, like from the Isle of Wight, um, that was a smaller relative of Mantellisaurus. As you can see there, um, we've got quite a good idea of what the skeleton of this animal looked like. But then in the top um, left, you can see that is the skull. That's like a skull we have from this animal. And um, this is something then that we CT scanned and that produces then what you can see there, the colorful image. That's when we've pulled that skull into side the computer and it lets us work out which bone is which, sort of pull them apart. And as Joe was saying, that helps us to um, uh, share the results with um, other researchers and help to understand them more. But what we can really do here that was much harder to do before is by having in this virtual space, we can also begin to reconstruct um, more what the animal would have looked like actually in life. So we can see here, this is where by pulling that um, skull in, been able to, to pull all the bones that make it up apart, be able to look in great detail at each one and work out you know, which holes need to be filled in and which cracks need to be repaired. And then we can pull them all back in together uh, to get a 3D picture of what the skull would have looked like when the animal was alive. And this then forms the basis of much more work we can do where we can start to look at, well, if this, these are the bones, what other tissues would have been there? So for example, what we do is we compare these um, bones from dinosaurs with those of their living relatives, so birds and then also crocodiles, as well as other animals like lizards. And from that, we can start to work out what features we see on bones that indicate the presence of specific other tissues. So here, for example, this is the skull of Coelophysis, like an early meat-eating dinosaur. And we can see here, this helps us to restore the jaw muscles of this thing. And so this is the kind of thing that paleontologists have been doing for a while. But in the old days, you either had to kind of do it by eye withdrawing or with like clay modeling. And it's much harder to make that sort of like a dynamic iterative process than it is now we have powerful computing with which we can do it. And what's also really cool is then we can take all these different kinds of data and pull them together. And we can start to use other techniques. So for example, um, biomechanical software. So software that people also use in engineering to start to work out, okay, how do the skulls and legs and other parts of dinosaurs actually work? Can we work out what they could do? How hard could they bite? How strong were they? And that kind of thing. And this really helps us start to put numbers on understanding the lives of dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. So you've talked there a little bit about the biomechanics, so how did they walk as well? Um, but we have a stegosaurus on the screen now, and I think there's also another way of uh, using biomechanics for it. It's also looking at the, at the kind of bite that the dinosaur had. Susie, you were working with um, a stegosaurus. Um, what sort of thing, how did you, uh, how scientists or paleontologists go on about finding out how, how was the bite? Um, and what did we find out with um, Stegosaurus, which is also quite a special specimen in the museum, isn't it? Yeah, we have this fabulous specimen of Stegosaurus in the museum. It's nicknamed Sophie. Um, we just saw it on the previous slide there. Um, and Sophie's amazing because it's the most complete Stegosaur known from anywhere in the world. Um, the amazing thing about Stegosaurus is although it's such an iconic dinosaur and everybody knows about it, um, it's actually really, really rare as fossils. Uh, and we only have about four complete Stegosauruses. Um, so when we got Sophie, um, we were able to do loads of cool things um, and really understand a lot about Stegosaurus that we didn't know before. And one of the things that some of my colleagues did um, was they took Sophie's skull, which is unique among Stegosaurs, in that all the bones are separated. And that's really good for us from a research point of view because it allows us to look at the shapes and the sizes of all the bones and really study them in a lot of detail. Um, and what they did was they CT scanned the skull of Sophie. And as David has explained, uh, with Hypsilophodon, they went through that process of kind of, kind of exploding it and then sticking it back together to produce these models that you can see on the screen and, and actually also um, 3D print a copy, um, which is what's on display in the gallery. The rest of the bones in the gallery are real, but, but the skull is this 3D print from this amazing model that was produced. Um, and then what they did was they used this uh, technique called finite element modeling, uh, which is an engineering technique to look at how hard Stegosaurus could bite. Now, Stegosaurus has really teeny, teeny, tiny teeth. So the crown to the tip of the tooth, the, 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 the length of the crown of the tooth is only about five millimeters in size. So I always looked at these and was like, you know, Stegosaurus is rubbish at eating. It must have been like slurping up some sort of sloppy pond weed or something because there's no evidence of chewing. And there's no evidence that the, that the, tooth, the teeth rubbed against each other. Um, they just, it just looked kind of 
rubbish at, at, at chewing basically just it didn't look like it was processing any food in its mouth um and so uh what my colleagues did actually was they they tested that so they um they used this technique and, and they they applied um, muscles to the skull and looked at how hard stegosaurus could bite and this is kind of a virtual twig that we can see on the screen here um, and they got stegosaurus to bite on it and what they found was that actually stegosaurus has a bite force quite similar to a sheep which I totally didn't expect at all. So it could probably have chomped through twigs and things like that. Um, and that is probably because it had this kind of keratinous, horny beak um, around the front of its mouth. And um, so it probably wasn't really using uh, its teeth a great deal. Um, so that's kind of an example of how, you know, I, we thought one thing and it's been totally overturned by being able to actually test it and put numbers on it um, with these sorts of analyses. I, I actually love that you said we, we got a stegosaurus to bite a twig. So even though you can't actually see it, you, you can actually model it. And, and it's like seeing it in real life, which is it's mind blowing. As you were saying it and I was like, oh, my God, this is so cool. And then you get surprises like this. And I think, David, there was another dinosaur as well that the, the solution, the, the result that you got was the opposite. You were expecting the bite to be quite strong and then it was quite weak, wasn't it? Yeah, something a bit like that. So this is another of the museum's famous dinosaurs. So this is um, Dippy the Diplodocus. And we weren't expecting Diplodocus to have like a powerful bite or anything. But still, like it's four, it's like three times, three to four times the size of Stegosaurus. So we thought, OK, it will have a more powerful bite. Do you think how much plant thinks fodder that thing would have to eat? It would must have something that would help it to um, deal with the plants it had around it. So um, I rebuilt the muscles of it and had a look to see how hard this thing could bite. And also here are the same kind of finite element plots. So again, the hotter colors are higher stress that we did when we were simulating different kinds of behaviors. What we found here is that the Prodocus had a weak bite. And again, we were kind of expecting that, but it was weaker than that of Stegosaurus. So it was weaker than we were expecting. And so that was a bit sort of, oh, right, what's going on then? So, and there's more things that interest about Diplodocus as well. So I've got a 3D print of the skull of Diplodocus here. It's not life-size, it's smaller, I'm afraid. But you can sort of see it here a bit. And you can see its teeth, they stick out out of the front of its mouth. And so this means the teeth of Diplodocus, they don't actually sort of shear or grind against each other like your teeth do. They just sort of grip. And so we wondered like, okay, it's got a weak bite and these like gripping teeth. Um, how does that mean it fed? And so we investigated different like behaviors. And what you can see here on the um, left is that is the that is when we're simulating it biting. So again, we're having it like bite into leaves, a bit like sort of the Stegosaurus. But on the right is where instead we had it pull at leaves. So Diplodocus has quite large areas on the back of the skull for where the neck muscles would attach. And from that, we think what it would, might have done is gripped onto leaves of its teeth like that, and then pulled with the neck to help detach the leaves afterwards. So it would make up for its weak bite forces by incorporating the neck to pull. And that's something we also see in some living herbivorous animals that they do. And so this get this like quite specialized feeding mechanisms. So we think the Diplodocus used this to help feed on quite soft plants, like um, ferns, also um, high leaves and trees. So that's kind of a way in which we didn't get the answer we necessarily expected and that helped us get like a new dimension on a dinosaur that we thought we knew. And then I suppose we have um, Camarasaurus and Diplodocus here on, on the screen. You can compare it with dinosaurs that might have had similar diets or that you would have expected um, to have similar diets, right? So Diplodocus and um, Camarasaurus, two sauropods with long necks. Um, they what, what do we know about them and what have we found out, David? So, yeah, so Camarasaurus is interesting because it's another sauropod that lived in the same time and place as Diplodocus. And it was overall similar, had the same like long neck and tail, but its skull was very, very different. So its skull was more like boxy and heavy and robust. So again, with the 3D prints that you could see, like this is the skull of Camarasaurus and that is the skull of Diplodocus. Like Camarasaurus has a far more powerfully built skull. And so we did the same kind of analyses, um, uh, rebuilding the muscles and simulating these feeding behaviors. And from this, we found that the bite of Camarasaurus was like powerful. It was similar to the bite force of a gorilla or a panda, like herbivorous animals that feed on tough, like woody plants. And we also found the skull was much, much stronger when um, coping with these like crunching bites. But when we simulated the same sort of pulling behaviors that we did with Diplodocus, we found that the skull of Camarasaurus didn't handle these very well at all due to features of the teeth. So this brings us like this idea that these animals are feeding quite differently with Camarasaurus like biting and crunching through coarser foliage from trees, 
whereas Diplodocus instead is like plucking at um, daintier foliage. And the fact that we've got these two animals that were similar and lived in the same time and place that were feeding differently, and also then Stegosaurus, which also lived alongside these sauropods, but we've already seen that had quite a different feeding mechanism. This helps us to work out the different roles that these animals would have had in their ecology and really helps like build up the um, world of the Jurassic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, that it, it just it still blows my mind that we can have a look at the uh, we have the techniques now to actually figure it out how how they used to it and 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 find out so much about about the lifestyles just from that. Uh, now we've had loads of questions from our audience. I'm, I'm going to uh, throw some at you because there, there's some that are interesting and actually one fits really well. Uh, something that I wanted to talk about next. Uh, so Rafael Steiner uh, on YouTube. Um, they are asking, how do you go about having educated guesses at the motorics of dinosaurs? So, so for example, the strength or the run speed. Um, and my next question actually is, was going to be, um, as well as looking at bones, I think we can also explore things that dinosaurs have left behind, like um, uh, footprints on the ground. And I think that links quite nicely with, with this question. Susie, can you tell us a little bit more about, about that, how we've gone about um, study all the kinds of fossils, so it's not just the, the fossil bones. Yeah, with regard to how fast uh, dinosaurs are running, we can use similar sorts of techniques to um, the ones that David was um, was talking about. We can also use um, uh, we can use computation computational robotics, so we can effectively build um, a dynamic model um, in a computer and then actually use that finite element analysis, again, that engineering technique to measure stresses in the bones and to put limits around the physical stresses that bones can withstand, um, and then actually make these robotic, these computational robotic models walk. Um, and so, some of my colleagues at uh, Manchester and Liverpool have found some really interesting results. Um, for example, um, they've done this with T-Rex and discovered that T-Rex couldn't actually run at all, and it could only probably move about 12 miles an hour. Now that is faster than we can move, we can run. So I would suggest that if you are being chased by a T-Rex, you still do run faster than the slowest person in the room. Um, however, it couldn't have been, it couldn't have caught up with a speeding Jeep like it did in Jurassic Park. So uh, if you're in your car, you're fine, for, just for future reference. But anyway, yeah, trackways. So trackways are another way we can look at locomotion and extinct animals. And of course, track fossils are, um, they're, they're fossil behavior. They're the way, um, the fossils are the way that the dinosaur was moving. Um, and we've got this, this image here of uh, a trackway of a sauropod, so something like a Camarasaurus or a Diplodocus that David's already been talking about. Um, and these tracks are, of course, preserved often on these, on these bedding planes, on these flat planes of rock, um, and they're subject to being eroded away. So I was down in the, on the beach in Wales a couple of weeks ago measuring one of these trackways and recording one of these trackways that's going to be destroyed by the tide eventually, you know, it'll just be eroded away. So what we can do is we can use some really cool new technology to actually record these sorts of trackways and keep them, you know, without having to collect them. So we can keep them virtually. Um, and this is an example where somebody's done this, where they've taken a photogrammetric model. So you take loads and loads and loads of photos, maybe a thousand photos from lots of different angles. Um, and then you put it in some really clever software. Don't ask me how it works. That builds an amazing 3D model. And we can see um, on the right image, this kind of heat map which shows the height. Um, so you can actually measure things like the depth of the footprints and the size of the footprints um, from, this sort of, from this sort of data. So it's a really good way of preserving um, footprint data that otherwise we wouldn't be able to collect at all. That's really cool. So not only for the analysis, but also for, for the fact that they need to be preserved and, and otherwise it wouldn't be. So it will be things that you couldn't come back to study once you've yeah. had them once. That's amazing. And exactly. Also, you yeah. know, that, that we, we, there's, you know, who knows what sort of technology might exist in the future or, or which amazing new methods, analytical methods might come up. So that's why we, we want to preserve fossils, um, you know, for perpetuity, because we never know what new technologies might come along that allow us to do really cool things in the future. I suppose, yeah, if you had told um, Gideon Mantell, for example, what, what you guys were doing with the Mantellisaurus, he would have never believed it. So he would have definitely been super excited about that. Um, now, we're getting loads of questions from our audience and they're really, really interesting. Um, so I'd like to ask you um, a couple of them. So there, uh, there are there, Daria, who is seven, um, she's on Facebook, she's asking, um, 
she would like to know how many different dinosaurs have been found so far and linked to that there's a question just said how many dinosaurs do you think still aren't haven't been found um so who would like to answer that joe would you like to go for that i'll have a go um uh, so in terms of how many um i'm not sure if anyone would really know the the true answer to that um certainly it's it's thousands and thousands um on average we find a new dinosaur every week so about 50 52 a, a year are found on average wow. and that's been going on since at least the sort of late 90s early 2000s that we know of um and that just seems to be increasing all the time um you know they found a new one on the isle of wight last week um, they're, they're finding new ones in China, the incredible uh, feathered ones all the time as well. And the more that we we look for them and like using new technology like this, um, I think the more we'll find and fill in those gaps. Um, but yeah, it's, it's got to be in the thousands and thousands of different species. And what about the dinosaurs that still need to, still need to be found? How many do you think um, are, are there out there for us to be found and uh, to find out about them? David, do you want to go for that one? Oh, um, that's very much a thing whereby it's very difficult to say. So we, it's, it's very difficult to say how many more we might find. We can, I guess we could get narrowed down a bit if we think about parts of the world that haven't been explored very thoroughly. Because mm -hmm. a big limiting thing on how many dinosaurs we can find is that to find them, we need um, well-preserved rock successions from the time of dinosaurs, and we need those to be accessible. So for many parts of the world, like for example, in Antarctica, there's a lot of rock that's undercovered by ice. And in other parts of the world, um, which are more tropical, it could be undercovered by lots of plant growth and that kind of thing. But I guess, like, who knows, maybe there'll even be technological advancements that allow us to explore these kind of regions and get a better idea of what's there. So, so for the moment, I'd imagine there's at least as many dinosaurs left in the ground to find as we have already done so. And so at the moment, given that, you know, depending on who you ask, we might have anything from sort of like 700 to like over a thousand dinosaurs. Who knows how many they could have originally been. There could have been far more than we know right now. So still not only uh, more to know about their ecology, their living habits, what, what, what we already know, but what we, we still need to find out about the ones that we already know, but the new ones that are yet to come. That's, that's incredible. So loads of work for future paleontologists that might uh, get inspired by you doing this talk. Um, a few people are also asking, um, and I suppose this question is, is quite good for um, David and, and Zuzi. You were talking about Diplodocus and Steg. So they would like to know, how would they have sound like um, and what noises could they make? Do we know and can we tell um, through the techniques that, that we've been looking into? Zuzi, you want to go for that? Yeah, so uh, dinosaurs probably didn't have a voice box. So they probably weren't roaring like a lion or a tiger or something like that. And they probably weren't singing like birds. Birds are the most close uh, living relatives to dinosaurs. So um, we can kind of, we usually use birds as a model for how dinosaurs might have behaved. Um, but in this case, we think that the voice box was, was evolved either within birds or kind of just before birds. So probably most dinosaurs, certainly things like Diplodocus and Stegosaurus, didn't have, well, didn't have the ability to growl. So they probably made kind of low rumbling noises. Um, uh, I don't know, I, I kind of imagine that the noises that they make would be something like an alligator or a crocodile. They're also closely related to dinosaurs, but not as closely related as birds are. Um, I imagine they'd sound a little bit like your stomach did when it's a little bit upset. <laughs> That's right. No, that's a really, really good answer. Um, and uh, another question that we had, and um, we had it quite early. Well, you actually answer um, Jane um, Hill on Facebook, who was asking, um, was the closest living relative to dinosaur is birds? But we had another really interesting question uh, from YouTube. What has been the most recent rewriting on, of dinosaur understanding? So anything that recently has changed of the way that we understand dinosaurs, what would you, what would you think? Um, have you got any ideas? I can I could see David thinking. Uh, so David, I'm going to go over to you. But you can pass this on to anyone. <laughs> well, I don't know. Like, if anyone, feel free to jump in. If anyone's got like an immediate thing, but I think there's been a few things that have really shaken up our understanding of dinosaurs in the last few years. So um, some of them have highlighted how little we know. So, for example, one thing which is still quite obscure, and there's still papers being published about, is exactly 
how the earliest dinosaurs evolved. So we still don't have a particularly solid idea of how the earliest dinosaurs and dinosaur-like animals, what exactly their relationships were. And so when certain dinosaur groups appeared, that remains quite uncertain. But as for things like really revolutionizing our understanding, one thing which Susan can talk about a lot better than me, actually, because um, it's something she was involved in, has shown us that we might actually be able to get um, uh, some of our dinosaur specimens might be a lot better preserved than we think. And there's a lot more sort of, of the information about dinosaur physiology potentially preserved than we thought there was before. So that was quite like a big kind of, whoa, there's a, potentially a lot of things going on here. So that was quite a big shakeup as well. But it's kind of hard to think of like one original moment because we're in like a continual sort of revolution. Like our understanding of dinosaurs has changed so much over the last like two decades. There's like just an ongoing like course of like changes as we see more bird di like dinosaurs and other things that, yeah, it's hard to pick out like one single thing for me at least. I don't know, the others probably have better ideas. And uh, Susie, I'm gonna go to you as well, but I suppose it's a little thing might then lead to bigger uh, discoveries as well. Um, as well, it's kind of like a chain reaction. But yeah, what, what was that um, bit that David was talking about that said, as uh, Susie might know yeah. more about that? <laughs> well, I, I mentioned it a little bit earlier about soft tissues in fossils. Yeah. So this idea that that actually soft tissues preserve over uh, longer timescales than um, we previously realised. And the research that I was involved in, um, we accidentally, um, we were looking for something entirely different, but we accidentally discovered um, some dinosaur blood. Um, we discovered dinosaur blood cells preserved. Um, and when we analysed those geochemically, we discovered that actually we had the breakdown products of haemoglobin, which is a major protein wow. in blood. Um, that was a, that actually preserved over geologic timescales. So um, there's been an increasing body of evidence for about 20 years that suggests that these kind of soft tissues um, can actually preserve uh, for a, a really long time. And we, you know, we really didn't know that at all um, before 10 years ago. And and you know, this opens up paleontology to a whole new way of investigation, whole new methods of investigation, kind of much more molecular uh, type methods. So there's loads of potential there in the future. Uh, we, we get in so many other questions and I'm, I'm afraid we might not be able to go through all of them uh, because we get into the end of the show. Uh, but one one thing that I'd like to ask you before we go back to uh, what dinosaur do you think you would have been if you could, you could pick a dinosaur to be, which one would you pick? Um, so there, there were um, there was this is a really interesting question on Facebook. Um, uh, on Facebook, yeah, the, uh, Pam is asking, how do you work out the color of the skin and feathers of dinosaurs? Do we know? Uh, Joe, you haven't talked to him a bit. Do you do you want to go for this or pass it on to someone? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll uh, tell you everything I know. So um, <laughs> it's actually quite a, a recent thing that um, some researchers that we, we, we know at the museum uh, and beyond have been, have been looking at. So um, we've been able to zoom in really, really close on these beautifully preserved uh, feathered dinosaurs, a lot of them, like I mentioned before, are found in China quite often, uh, but the conditions have got to be just right for these feathers to preserve in detail. And we can zoom in with a really powerful microscope and we can actually identify some of the individual cells which make up colour. Um, so we can tell the difference between different shades and different colours, not all of them, um, because they don't always preserve as well. They either break down when the animal dies or they don't fossilise but we can identify individual cells um, which control for colour. So black, white and brown are ones at the minute um, that we're able to tell. Um, so we can see that a lot of these feathered dinosaurs are kind of like a lot of the paleo art that comes out, these reconstructions are kind of accurate. So they'd have sort of banding of these different colours across their body, um, probably quite similar to a lot of maybe birds of prey and things like that that you, you get nowadays. That's a great answer. Now, um, guys, we're getting to the end of the show, so we're going to have to uh, finish up really soon. But I'm going to go back to, to that question. Can you guys tell me, if you have to pick a dinosaur uh, that you would like to become, uh, which dinosaur do you think you would be? Let's start with um, David, for example. So if you ask what dinosaur I'd like to be, <laughs> I think I'd quite like to be one of the really big duckbill dinosaurs. So some of the, so you think of the duckbill dinosaurs like Parasaurolophus, some of their relatives, like an animal called Shantungosaurus, got really big, like as big as the sauropod dinosaurs. I think that'd be pretty cool because you just hang around, 
Uh, you know, they're highly social, which sounds pretty good. I'm sure it sounds pretty good to a lot of people right now. And you'd be really big, you'd be bigger than everything else and therefore better. And you could like smack around any like theropod that fancy to go with you. So I think that'd be pretty good. You'd be quite safe and quite a nice life. As for what dinosaur I'd actually be, I bet <laughs> if I woke up as one, I'd, I'd get something rubbish like a duck. I bet I'd wake up, everyone else would be a dinosaur and I'd be like a duck. And I'm like, oh, this is rubbish. And of course, because <laughs> our dinosaurs, this like opens up a whole other sort of like lifestyles that they've got. But yeah, so hopefully I'd get to be like a giant duck bill dinosaur that we'd, we'd have to see. That's fair enough. Um, Joe, what, do, what would you pick? Uh, I think I think I'd maybe be a triceratops. I mean, um, similar reasons to David, really. They're, they're really big. Um, not a lot of predators would probably mess with them. Have you seen the size of their horns? Um, and I think they'd be, uh, you know, pretty pretty nice life, just roaming around, chomping on some vegetation and uh, looking scary. I think that'd be quite nice. That's brilliant. And uh, Susie, are you are you going to go for a herbivore like the like David and Joe? Would you pick something different? What would you pick? I would pick Archaeopteryx, the first bird. Imagine being a bird. How cool is that? I would like. <laughs> I'd like to be able to fly. Um, they've got quite big brains, um, which would be, I imagine that would be a nice thing to have. Um, you, could, you, could, you could fly. I mean, it would be so cool. And uh, you could fly above the heads of all these giant dinosaurs like Joe and David and their, you know, sauropods and their triceratopses and their hadrosaurs. Um, and, yeah, I think that would be, that'd be a cool thing to be, one of the first birds. <laughs> That's really brilliant. And uh, with that lovely, that, those three lovely uh, I'm going to tell you that we've reached the end of the show so I'm going to have to say goodbye to you guys but it was a pleasure to have you there so bye Susie, David and Joe and hopefully see you soon for another show um, and I'm going to say goodbye as well to all our uh, uh, all the people watching but it was a pleasure to be here for you and so thank you so much for watching and sending all your questions so we couldn't get through so all the questions that we have but don't worry we have more dinosaur shows planned for the future so just keep an eye out um, and remember that the museum is now open so you can go and see some of the specimens that we were talking about tonight definitely mantelisaurus sophie the stegosaurus and um, and the rest of the dinosaurs that are in the dinosaur gallery you have to book your ticket online is free uh, but you can you can visit us there in that amazing building that we're in um, but i'm going to say goodbye to all of you now and i'm going to leave you in about 15 minutes to start the jurassic lark quiz with my colleagues alison and khalil to test your knowledge on dinosaurs see how much you've learned with us tonight it's going to be super super fun uh, so start thinking about your team's names get pen and paper for the answers um and i'll leave you with alison and khalil and i'll say goodbye now bye everyone
Thank you. 
Hello, good evening, and welcome to Jurassic Lark Pub Quiz. I'm Khalil Thurloway. And I'm Alison Sheen. We hope that you enjoyed that fantastic uh, panel discussion earlier, and you've now had some time to grab yourself a pen, some paper, and maybe a little drink during the break, because it's time to put your prehistoric knowledge to the test. Now, if you're watching with other people, you might want to form yourself into a little team. Or if you're feeling particularly competitive, you can compete against one another to see, out, see who comes up out top of the food chain. And we love, for hearing from, we love hearing from you guys in the chat, uh, especially your amazing team names and stuff. So please do keep those dino puns coming in the comments. One thing we do ask, though, is that you don't post any, post any answers in the chat. You may be super proud of your answer, but it can spoil the quiz for other people. Likewise, if you see an answer posted in the chat, maybe think twice before you copy it, because there's a pretty good chance it could be totally wrong. <laughs> now, we've got four different rounds for you tonight with three questions each. Um, you get one uh, point for each correct answer. So we have a total of 12 possible points up for grabs for you tonight. And we've got rounds about dinosaur general knowledge, dinosaurs in popular culture, dinosaur identification and creatures that are sort of dinosaur adjacent. We'll run through all of the questions first and then we'll come back and we'll give you all of the answers. Don't worry, each question is going to appear on the screen so you won't have to remember it. So if we're all ready, let's get started. Okay, without further ado, round one. General dinosaur knowledge. So question one, in the 1920s, Paleontologists discovered a fossilized dinosaur that was suspiciously close to a fossilized nest of eggs. So they thought that these eggs had been the last meal of the dinosaur and assumed that it had been raiding the nest. So they called it egg thief. Later, it was discovered that these suspicions were unfounded. And, and in fact, the dinosaur had been incubating its own eggs. However, they decided it was too late to change the dinosaur's official scientific name. But what dinosaur are we talking about? So we've got three options here. If we get to the question slide, <laughs> we have which <laughs> dinosaur was initially misidentified as an egg thief. We've got A, B, and C. We're not going to tell you their names yet, but you have a look at and see if, which one you think would be robbing a nest or would be wrongfully accused of robbing a nest. Oh, that one's tricky, actually. I'm not too sure about that one. <laughs> We'll see, we'll see. Oh, and just uh, before we go on, we've got some great uh, quiz names coming through uh, from our from our viewers. We've got the Raptor Squad, Jurassic Girls, Dodos, Old Fossils, and Team One Point Five. <laughs> I'm not sure which which uh, which name I like best. Oh, Nigel Marvin's eggs. You quite like that one. All right, Brilliant. I'm rooting for Nigel Marvin's eggs so far. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> So let's have our second question. Now, dinosaurs have uh, a reputation for being very large animals, but in reality, they, they came in all sorts of shapes and sizes, although the big ones certainly were pretty massive. But what we want to know is whether the biggest dinosaur from millions of years ago were bigger than the biggest mammals alive today. So which is heavier the biggest mammal alive today or the biggest dinosaur alive back then? What do we think? Is it's that a tricky, tricky one? one? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't want to chat too much about it in case we give them too many clues. True, true. But there were some pretty massive dinosaurs, weren't there? Yeah, yeah, they got pretty big. And a lot of them had names like, you know, Titan Lizard and, you know, uh, like Mega Lizard and things like that. So those names imply they're pretty big. They do, they do. They're a bit of a giveaway, but we'll see. We'll, we'll see what people guess. So uh, let's read up question three. So mm -hmm. Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops are two of the most famous dinosaur species by far. And they're often pictured battling it out in pictures, films, toys, games. But 
When you think about it, the era of the dinosaurs lasted almost 180 million years, and the different species were around for different parts of it. So some dinosaurs actually didn't even overlap by you know, at all in, in their existence. They were millions of years apart. But what we want to know is, would the classic battle between T-Rex and Triceratops actually have happened? Did they share the planet? Or would they have been separated by millions of years? So this is a 50-50 chance. So, um, you know, you throw in your bone here, give me a guess. <laughs> yeah, you've got a fairly good chance. It's tough because there are in, there are so many different depictions in popular culture, aren't there? And you, yeah. Well, so there, are, are there, are some of, there are some of people fighting dinosaurs, which is <laughs> obviously... Always love that. <laughs> As, uh, tens of millions of years between that. Yeah, yeah. Pretty, pretty, pretty wrong. But, uh, yeah, but it I, makes I, for I'm great entertainment. It does. It really does. I'm confident lots of people will get this one right. <laughs> okay, we'll see how that's done. We'll see. Okay, we're on to round two already. Wow. So, so this round is all about dinosaurs in popular culture. So this is one of my favourite rounds. Now, Jurassic Park, Park. We all love that film. It's fantastic. It's probably the most famous appearance of dinosaurs on film. And it features a number of dinosaur species, most of which were from the Cretaceous period and were never alive in the Jurassic. But we can look past all of that because it's, it's such a great film. But the first dinosaur to appear on screen in Jurassic Park is a Jurassic species. But what dinosaur was it? So what was the first dinosaur seen on screen in Jurassic Park? I can see the scene in my head. It's like seared into my young mind. I know. <laughs> Tell me about it. I watched it back recently and I found myself literally holding my breath during that scene. It's like, Alison, breathe, breathe. I mean, it holds up, you know, it even does. though a few bits of, of uh, CGI in that film, it still looks all right. Yeah, definitely. definitely. And also, you can understand why, um, why Jurassic Park chose a lot of Cretaceous dinosaurs to be kind of uh, in the film and in the in the park, because the Cretaceous dinosaurs are some of the coolest ones. They're some of the the Cretaceous was you know the latest period of dinosaurs, so they had time to evolve all these cool features and stuff. So you can see why they did it. Yeah, yeah. Cretaceous Park doesn't have quite the same ring to it as, as Jurassic Park. No, maybe. <laughs> Branding. <laughs> Branding, absolutely. <laughs> so uh, on to question two, I think. So this one is close to my heart. In the Tomb Raider series of video games, so-called archaeologist Lara Croft uh, encounters live dinosaurs at several points in her travels in a few of the games. But instead of wondering how and why these long extinct animals are alive and well and reporting her incredible discovery to the world, she kills them so, they can, so she can continue robbing the tubes. Uh, so what we want to know is, can you name any one of the dinosaur species that Lara helped guide to a second extinction in the, in the games. So there are a couple of options for this. Um, and there's one actually trick answer that we might fall into the trap of if you're not careful. Okay, so I would not have got this, this one at all because I have no idea about Tomb Raider, <laughs> I have to say. I did not know there were dinosaurs in it. I mean, yeah, they take you by surprise. Even, yeah. even after the first game when you've seen them already, you're like, oh, they're doing dinosaurs again? <laughs> fourth game when they're still doing dinosaurs like, but wait they've put in a dinosaur level again yeah i don't recall the, never get the, old. the archaeologists at our museum ever mentioning fighting dinosaurs as part of their their work well that's because they you know they're too traumatized they come back having <laughs> a dinosaur in the head with two pistols <laughs> across a gorge or something <laughs> okay on to question three. Oh now this question is one that is, is close to my heart, actually, because uh, it's about the uh, Crystal Palace dinosaurs, which are just down the road from me, and I, I love visiting on a regular basis. So obviously, Crystal Palace Park in South London is well known for its fantastic Victorian dinosaur sculptures. And it's obviously particularly well known for the fact that some of these are based on interpretations that are, that are quite out of date and, and very, very wrong indeed. The most famous, of course, being Iguanodon, which is depicted with a, a horn on its nose but, but, that we now know was actually a thumb spike. But the original uh, clay mould of the Iguanodon sculpture 
something very unusual was, was done with this original clay mould. So, so what was that? So was it given to Queen Victoria? Did people have a party in it? Or was it blown up with dynamite? Two of those sound really fun. I know. I mean, they all sound plausible, <laughs> broadly plausible. <laughs> I know which. I know which two I would pick. I don't know. Which yeah, I. I, I no, they both sound really, really fun. And once in a yeah. life, this is. <laughs> I know exactly which two you you would pick. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you could have a party in it and then blow it up and then give the remains to Queen Victoria. Yep, you could do all three. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> Sorted. <laughs> well, we'll, see. we'll see. We'll see what our, uh, what our viewers think on that one. So A, B or C. All right, should we go on to round three? Let's go on to round three. Okay, so round three, uh, if, if any of you watched the Pokemon cartoon in the early noughties, this may be a familiar format to you, but we're going to play a game of Who's That Dinosaur? Um, it's, you know, it sounds better with the music, but we couldn't get the rights. So we're going to show you some silhouettes of dinosaurs, and we need you to identify the dinosaur from just the outline. So first up, what do you think this dinosaur is? Tell us who's that dinosaur. So we'll give you a chance to have a look at it. Obviously, it's you know quadrupedal looking. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got a little thing on the back of its head. Got some little pointy bits at the top. Who knows what they might be? So this is a kind of reasoning round. You're gonna have to use your okay. eyes and your intuition. Ooh, tricky that one. I'm not sure. I've I've got a bit of an idea, but um, yeah. I mean, we'll I see. put this we'll round see. together, so they're all in my head. <laughs> <laughs> So let's have our, our next uh, dinosaur. So this one is a carnivorous dinosaur. It's about three meters tall. I don't want to give too much away, but there is a big clue in this picture. You'll see that there is something in this dinosaur's uh, mouth, which might give you a bit of a clue to, to what it might be. But yeah, I don't want to give too much away, but I think people will get this, get this one. Fingers crossed. Yeah, I, th I think... Oh, th if there's a the clue might tip it for some people yeah i think so i think so i think it's quite a popular one as well <laughs> yeah all right let's take it to the last one this okay. one's about about the same size as the last one because I, I forgot to say actually the uh the first dinosaur we showed you is relatively small about the size of a, a sheep or a really big dog uh this one is about the same size as the as the as the second one uh so it's about three meters tall at the shoulder uh but it's kind of different looking it's got that thing on the back of its head. It probably had a different lifestyle to the other one, but I don't know. You're going to have to use your deductive reasoning. Mm, yeah, this one is great, actually. This is a fantastic silhouette. <laughs> <laughs> it almost reminds me of, um, going back to the PlayStation reference, Abe's Odyssey, some of the creatures from that. <laughs> Deep cut for the late 90s, early noughties kids out there. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people will get this one. Hopefully. Hopefully, hopefully. Okay, so I think that's the end of Who's That Dinosaur, isn't it? It is, yes. We're going on to our final okay. round. Oh, so this round is I Can't Believe It's Not a Dinosaur. Now we're going to focus in this round on some of the animals that are commonly mistaken for dinosaurs, but they are not dinosaurs, as many of our curators and scientists will stress and get very irate about. If you ever want to so, wind up a paleontologist, just list some of these and pretend they're dinosaurs absolutely it works every single time <laughs> so for our first not a dinosaur which group of prehistoric marine reptiles has a name that's derived from the greek for fish lizard and that was a great picture just before this <laughs> <laughs> very carefully hand edited by yours truly thank you very much beautifully done Khalil well done <laughs> the, the artistic endeavor that went into that oh yes yeah. it's my <laughs> finest work <laughs> but this one think carefully you might be able to get this if you, if you think about it it's the, no googling the, 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 no, no google translating yeah definitely no googling just think Look about it you. You, can, you can get this one yourselves <laughs> all right so let's uh, let's move on to question two okay Favorite prehistoric creatures, Dimetrodon. is a large predatory prehistoric creature with a big sail on its back that's often mistaken for a dinosaur because, you know, it looks kind of lizardy. It's got big teeth, 
Um, but, but it's actually not. Uh, in fact, Dimetrodon became extinct millions of years before the dinosaurs even appeared. So what we want to know is which of these three groups of animals is Dimetrodon most closely related to? So we've got uh, a crocodile, we've got a seagull, and we've got a devastatingly handsome young science communicator. Do we, do, which which well, do you think that is, is a tricky one? Related to Dimitrodon. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've been called worse. Than, I love uh, that you, prehistoric. I know. I love that you you used your, yourself in in this image. Is there something you want to tell me it's, about your family family tree? <laughs> <laughs> it's an image that I know I've got the rights to. <laughs> <laughs> Copyright be damned. <laughs> yeah. Now I actually got the answer to that one. So. Um, but, and I hope lots of our viewers will, but it is tricky. It, it, it is definitely a tricky one. So our final, uh, not a dinosaur, <laughs> is the pterosaur. Now pterosaur means uh, winged li lizards, and these were prehistoric uh, flying reptile cousins of the dinosaurs. They lived around the same time as dinosaurs as well. Birds, on the other hand, are direct descendants of the theropod dinosaur group. And they evolved a powered flight a little bit later on. But pterosaurs weren't the first animals to fly under their own power. So which group of animals evolved powered flight first? And we're talking powered flight here, not simply gliding. Okay, so there's a there's a few there's a few different groups of animals that can fly nowadays. So I guess you've got to kind of yeah, w try and think which ones might have evolved first and which ones might have evolved flight first. I think maybe diversity is probably the, the key to this answer. Definitely, definitely. Um, and I'm, ha I'm confident lots of people will get this one. <laughs> I hope so. I, hope, I, 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 think, hope. I think it might be a bit of a tricky curveball though, we'll see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We'll see. We'll see. I'm. I'm confident. I'm confident. There are. Yeah, we've got a lot of uh, very clever viewers out there. So. Hey, that viewers, Alison has more faith in you than I do. <laughs> so, what do we think? Was that an easy quiz? A hard quiz? Do we think we're going to get lots of high scorers? I. I hope we get some some high scorers, but I don't want everyone to be right at the top. I hope that oh. there's just so that we know that we've you know pushed people a little bit. <laughs> Oh, and we had a, a late entrance in for the, the, the team names, Team Rex. That's pretty great. I'm talking about Nigel Marvin's eggs, just because I really want to see Nigel Marvin lay eggs. But Team <laughs> Rex is a great name as well. Team Rex is pretty good too. Well, we'll see how they all did. So uh, shall we give them the answers? All right, let's go for it. So okay. first questions first. Uh, going back to round one, question one, we asked you, which of these dinosaurs was initially misidentified as an egg thief? And if you put B, then you were correct. This is an oviraptor. So its name is made up of the Latin words for egg, like in the modern words oval, meaning egg-shaped, or ovulation, producing eggs, and to take or seize, like how birds of prey are sometimes referred to as raptors because they seize their prey. Or if you have someone's attention, then you might say that they're wrapped. So, that kind of uh, breaking down of, of uh, scientific names of dinosaurs and animals and, and all sorts of other things, you can break it down into its component parts and, and use those, those uh, individual parts to work out what the whole name means. And there are some brilliantly named dinosaurs as well, aren't there? I mean, Oviraptor is a fantastic name, Egg Thief. When you start looking I... at what, what the, the names mean, it's, it's brilliant. <laughs> There was, there was um, a relative of, an, of Ankylosaurus that was discovered a few years ago, and it was called uh, Zool Destroyer of Shins, but in Latin. Uh, because Destroyer of Shins, because just like uh, the Ankylosaurus had this big old club at the end of its tail, and it was quite low to the ground, but also it was called Zool after the, uh, the creatures in the original Ghostbusters film, because it kind of, the, the face looked a little bit like the monsters uh, from the end of the film. That is awesome. I mean, you've got to love paleontologists and their their, na their naming conventions. It's amazing. <laughs> you give geeks power, and that's what we do. <laughs> Brilliant.
brilliant. So well done if you you guessed that one, the, the oviraptor. Uh, so let's remind people of the uh, second question. So we asked you, uh, which was heavier, the biggest mammal living or the biggest dinosaur? So let's have our answer was in fact the biggest mammal. Of course, the blue whale, the, the largest animal to ever have lived in the ocean, obviously. Um, things can get a little bit bigger when they're supported by water, but there were some pretty massive uh, dinosaurs out there, the, the titanosaurs particularly. However, they, they weren't heavier than uh, the blue whale. So um, the maximum confirmed length of the blue whale is about 29.9 meters, 98 feet, uh, and they weigh about 190 tons. That's They can get up to that. But, in contrast, Titanosaur weighed between, we think, 99 and 110 tonnes. So still pretty impressive, but doesn't beat the blue whale. And some of those big sauropods could still get longer than a blue whale yeah. now, but yeah. just nowhere near as heavy because they'd have to put all that weight on their legs. Absolutely. I mean, it's amazing that some some Titanosaurs got as big as they did, some, some of those uh, sauropod dinosaurs. Um, they are very, very impressive. And we've got Hope, the blue whale skeleton, uh, hanging in the Hintzy Hall, um, the main hall of the, of the museum. And she's pretty huge, but she's only a juvenile. She's a, not even a fully grown adult. Absolutely. So they're just uh, wonderful, wonderful animals, the blue whale. I do love coming in and seeing uh, Hope hanging in Hintzy Hall. She's, she's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. It was lovely to go back into the museum to do some filming with you uh, a couple of weeks ago and just walk in. <laughs> and see hope hanging there so great so great i do i do miss it i do miss it but we'll, we'll hopefully be back soon <laughs> see so moving so, on to question three so uh we were asking you whether t-rex and triceratops really would have been hanging out together and probably duking it out and the answer was yes they were uh so they both lived in the late cretaceous period so like we were saying about jurassic park the coolest period for dinosaurs. Um, and particularly the last few million years just before the mass extinction event that wiped out most of the non-avian dinosaurs 66 million years ago. So all those depictions of T-Rex and Triceratops battling out, that could have happened. Absolutely. Um, and, what a, and what a battle because uh, tri Triceratops was, was no slouch. Look at those, those massive horns. Yeah, you would not want to take one on, especially because I think there's evidence that he lived in herds as well. And so mm. that's not just three horns you're dealing with, that's like 30 horns. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> okay, so well done if you got that one correct as well. I'm, I'm hoping lots of you did. Um, but let's move on to our pop culture round, uh, round two. Um, and so our first question uh, for that one was about Jurassic Park. We asked you, what was the first dinosaur seen on screen in that movie? Did anyone get this right, I wonder? I think lots of people would have done because it's such an iconic scene, isn't it? But let's see the answer. Brachiosaurus. Of course. How can you forget? <laughs> It was such a fantastic uh, scene and you, it was that really dramatic um, music as well. John Williams score and you've got the main characters gazing in one do, 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 do. <laughs> the one. Wait, I'm not sure how much of that I can do before we get sued. So I'm going to stop there. Oh, God, yeah, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, everyone uh, remembers that scene. Now, obviously, we can't show you that iconic scene because of copyright, but but here's a plastic toy Brachiosaurus, which is just as good. <laughs> right, especially with that musical rendition we've just given you. <laughs> yes, thank you, Khalil, that was beautiful. <laughs> so Our hopefully many question. of you... Sorry. Yep, I was, gonna, I was gonna say, hopefully many of you got that one correct. But let, yeah, let's go on to our next question. So we were asking you about the Tomb Raider series of games, and we asked you to name one species of the several that Lara has put a cap in the skull of uh, during her travels. And so the options we will accept are Velociraptor, Tyrannosaurus Rex, or Compsognathus. She does kill a couple of pterodactyls, but we're not accepting those because as we said previously, not a dinosaur. Like Indiana Jones before, there are a few things that Lara does that 
differ from what most archaeologists would consider best practice, uh, including, but not limited to, partially demolishing the Great Wall of China, battling an evil clone of herself, and the aforementioned dinosaur murder. <laughs> I need to start playing Tomb Raider. She's such a professional. Her, Absolutely. Her... Professionalism. <laughs> oh, fantastic. I, I did like that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, and on to our final question, I think, of this round, which was, ah, oh, yes, it was about the Crystal Palace uh, Iguanodon um, sculpture. We asked you uh, what was done with the original clay mould of that particular dinosaur. We gave you three options. Was it given to Queen Victoria? Did people have a party in it? Or was it blown up with dynamite? Come on, so, come on dynamite. Come, come on, dynamite, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, sadly not, Khalil. But people did have a party in it, which is which is kind of cool. <laughs> and very, very strange. That's very so Victorian. It, oh, totally Victorian. So it was the sculptor Benjamin uh, Waterhouse Hawkins. He held a New Year's Eve banquet inside the hollowed out body of this this iguanodon and he invited 21 vip guests of course including the founder of the natural history museum richard owen now obviously you can see from the picture here because of the size and the sort of weird unwieldy nature of the sculpture the waiters had to have a raised kind of walkway platform to be able to deliver the food to the guests um so not the most practical of dining experiences but wow <laughs> I wonder if there was some kind of hierarchy, like how do you decide who sits at the head end and who sits at the bum end? <laughs> like, I reckon Richard a... I reckon Richard was at the head, definitely. Richard <sighs> yeah, he was he was famously a bossy man. But like I, I don't know, like it'd be an honor to be invited, but then if you get sat at the bum of the dinosaur, is that a kind of like subliminal diss? <sighs> <laughs> oh <laughs> and in Victorian times as you as well. Oh dear. The man <laughs> <laughs> but, um, okay, yeah. so next up, so next up, we've got our "Who's That Dinosaur" round, and I wish we had the the music from from the Pokemon cartoon, but we're just going to have to imagine it in our heads. So first up, we had our sheep-sized dinosaur. I don't know if any of you got it. This was Protoceratops. This is a part of the same group of beaked herbivorous dinosaurs that included the more famous Triceratops. Um, and my favorite ceratopsid, Styracosaurus, which was essentially a triceratops, but with a cooler, more fancy frill. Um, but Protoceratops, although it lacked the horns that most of its uh, close relatives had, it still got that frill, that distinctive frill and the beak on the front of its head that mark it out as part of that family. Fantastic. That, that was quite a tricky one. I don't know how many people have, would have got that. I'm not sure I would have got that one, to be honest. <laughs> I would have I thought it was some, some kind of ceratops, but I don't think I would have got the exact species. I think this was probably the the, the middling one. I think this, this number two, I think, was the easiest. I think number three, yeah. I would have thought is the hardest. I don't know. I guess number three straight away, but maybe that's just me. I mean, you work <laughs> so, at the Natural History Museum. <laughs> well, true, true. <laughs> <laughs> so our second uh, uh, dinosaur, this one, hopefully lots of you guessed. Shall we reveal it? It was Baryonyx. Many people's favourite dinosaur. This one, a UK dinosaur, which is fantastic. A relative of uh, Spinosaurus. So uh, Baryonyx lived in the area that includes what is now the the UK. Um, and because of the shape of its snout and 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 its teeth, uh, we think that fish formed a large part of Baryonyx dire which is why we see the little fish depicted there and its name um actually means heavy claw they've got these amazing um large curved claws that we think it might have used to actually hook fish from rivers so well done if you guessed baryonyx i'm hoping lots of you got that one yeah that, that's quite a well-known one especially here in the uk yeah. so this third one another large dinosaur but quite different looking this was the longest word we've got today, Parasaurolophus. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't know how accurate that colour scheme is, but great paint job, love it. Um, but there's a debate as to what the long crest on the back of its head was for. Uh, various theories include visual signalling to other members of the herd, regulating body temperature, 
or just amplifying their vocal cords, uh, vocal calls, sorry. Uh, so I, I, I really like the last option. I really hope that it was just like yelling all the time. <laughs> Because yeah. that outfit definitely yells. Like absolutely. Oh, yeah, I mean, you know, who 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 needs a that for display when you've got those those gorgeous colours? And yeah, I like to imagine it like like really honking really loudly like a geese to <laughs> amplifying it. <laughs> like a yeah, like a giant nightmare goose. Yeah, giant nightmare <laughs> goose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but well done if you got Parasolophilus. Uh, it, it was tricky, but I, I feel like these guys featured in some of the Jurassic Park movies, which makes me think that people might have True. might have guessed it. So we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> so we move on, I think, to our final round. Final round. I can't believe it's not a dinosaur. So uh, we started off uh, asking you uh, which group of marine reptiles is named after the Greek for fish lizard. So I wonder how many people got this one correct. I'm hoping quite a few, but the answer is ichthyosaurs. Hopefully you guys got that one correct. Now, uh, ichthyosaurs, they look almost a bit like dolphins today or, or like uh, modern fish. They're, they're not long necked like the, the plesiosaurs, they're, they're short necked. They first appeared around 250 million years ago and at least one species survived until about 90 million years ago. And That's the first, one. yeah, not bad. And the first um, complete ichthyosaur skull was actually found by Joseph Anning, who, who was a brother of Mary Anning. And then uh, Mary Anning herself, as still as a, a young girl, actually found the torso of the same specimen. And we have that, that skull at the museum, which is pretty fantastic. One thing I love about ichthyosaurs, not just in the kind of um, artistic recreations, but in the fossils themselves, their eyes just look so big and round and buggy. They always look like they're startled. So yeah. you see a fossil of them, they look like they've just kind of turned a corner and seen you and then whoop. <laughs> Yeah, their fossils are particularly amazing. The eyes, they, they always look like they've got armour around them. They're, they're very, yeah. very cool. Brilliant. Okay, to question two. So our penultimate question. Which of these creatures is most closely related to Dimetrodon? So I won't take it as an insult if you picked me, um, because <laughs> actually that's the correct answer. So Dimetrodon is part of a group called the Synapsids, which, uh, which diverged from... Uh, Kind of reptiles and, and birds quite early on and the synapsid group actually includes mammals just like us so i don't know if you can see the resemblance i've folded away my sail uh, yeah. but you know when it's sunny i like to get it out and you know wait <laughs> with it signal some other members of my community <laughs> yeah I, I couldn't see it myself but yeah now you say it now you say it yeah what if i turn I, sideways like that ah uh, there you go there it is there it is. It's uncanny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like lots of people people might have guessed the the uh, the, the reptile, the crocodilian, for this one, uh, and not necessarily the mammal. So uh, so well done if you got that one correct. Well, cro crocodilians are surprisingly kind of anciently diverse lineage, mm. old. But a very cool question, Khalil. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> so we. We come to our final question of our final round, which was about powered flight. So we asked you which group of animals first evolved powered flight? And the answer is, and hopefully you got this one, insects. But so, can you think about it? <laughs> so go ahead. So um, pterosaurs, obviously, they did evolve flight quite early, but insects came first, then pterosaurs, then birds evolved power flight, and then mammals. A bit later on, mammals, uh, bats were the first mammals that evolved powered flight. So we are talking and, about flying under our own steam, not gliding. And because they've had so long to evolve uh, since evolving flight, that's one of the reasons that there's such a huge diversity of insects that can fly. Uh, you know, they've 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 spawned out into kind of every ecological niche possible. They've diversified into all these different forms, everything from you know, crane flies to, to dragonflies to beetles, ants, everything. Uh, 
and even insects that we don't normally think of as flying, like stuff like ants and termites, they do have winged reproductive stages and stuff like that. They're fantastic. They're some of the best flyers as well. When you think about hoverflies and, and the things that they can do, absolutely amazing. Yeah, and so, dragonflies, yes. like in the picture, they can uh, they they can kind of control each of their four wings independently, and th yeah, they, they can go from a standing hover to full speed really quickly. They've really nailed it. They absolutely have. So there we have it. We, we've come to the end of our quiz. So do let us know your scores. I know some of them. Uh, okay, some of you some scores coming in already. Coming in already. Some very impressive scores, I see. So we've got, let's have a look. Ah, oh, Harry, seven years old, 12 out of 12. And oh, look at that. Angel Marvin's eggs, 12. Yes. <laughs> you didn't let me down. Killian is, <laughs> is a very, very happy man. I'm proud of you, Nigel Marvin's eggs. <laughs> <laughs> yep we've got some sixes and sevens as well six out of 12 for jude well done guys congratulations because that was a tricky quiz i think that bears um, that's a good team name that bears is a good good team name <laughs> so, it's been a big spread guys. of scores so i, I think uh, we've we might have pitched it right because some people you know did pretty well and then other people did did pretty well but had a bit of a challenge with some of the questions yeah, that's fantastic. Nine out of ten. Coprolites. Coprolites. Another good name. Fossilized poo. Excellent. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Yeah, I, I think we pitched it right. I, I always knew we'd get some high scorers with this one because there are always loads of people out there that love their dinosaurs and, and know everything. Um, so, yeah, I was pretty confident. But, but well done to everybody. Fantastic job. And, and thank you so much for joining us. Part of me is quite curious as to what questions people found the hardest but mm. <laughs> in the comments and we'll, we'll read them later because I yeah. think it's time for us to go we've come to the end of our quiz um I've had an amazing time I hope you've enjoyed yourself Alison it's been brilliant uh, thank you so much for putting the those questions together Khalil. Those oh I had a great together. time <laughs> 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 um I, I spent longer than I should have on those who's that dinosaur slides but thank you so much for joining us at home guys um I hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have uh, we've got the lates every month, last Friday of the month, uh, with different themes every single month. Keep an eye on our social media channels, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, and on our webpage, nhm.ac.uk, for details. We've also got our Nature Live talks every Tuesday at 12 noon and every Friday at 10.30 a.m. And those topics will be up online as well on the social media and our website. Uh, but and have you got anything to add, Alison? No, just uh, thank you all again for your, your fantastic answers um, and for your brilliant scores and for your brilliant team names. Have a wonderful weekend and uh, we hope to see you again soon. Until next time. Bye bye. <laughs>